Hello, everyone, and thank you for continuing to join us throughout the day here at the Lithum Partners Spring 2024 Investor Conference. Uh, my name is Robert Bloom, Managing Partner of Lithum Partners, and uh, we are joined once again by Mr. Brian Ostroff. Brian is the president of Ariane Phosphate, uh, ticker symbol of DRRSF on the OTCQX uh, and DAN on the TSXV. A lot of letters being thrown out there. Hopefully you caught them all. Um, Brian, first off, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Always a, a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Uh, I do want, uh, before I begin, uh, we're going to put this in a little bit of a fireside chat format. Uh, but before we begin, I do want to remind everyone that if you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Brian uh, and you haven't already done so throughout the conference here, uh, go ahead and shoot me an email. That's bloom, B-L-U-M, at lithumpartners.com, or you can go to the website uh, for the conference, lithumpartners.com forward slash spring 2024. Uh, from there, you can click on the uh, investor and attendee registration and uh, and get all uh, all started there. So, uh, Brian, let's uh, start maybe a little, uh, you know, we normally tend to go macro and then kind of dive into the micro of the project. Let's reverse things around here just a little bit. All right. Um, remind listeners first off about the project and uh, and then we'll we'll sort of go from there. Yeah. So um, Ariane Phosphate, we are the owner of the uh, LACA Paul Phosphate Deposit in uh, Quebec. Uh, so, you know, right off the bat, great jurisdiction, very mining friendly. Um, as some of your viewers that have seen uh, the interviews in the past, look, uh, phosphate generally does not come from wonderful places in the world. Uh, Russia, phosphate fertilizer from China, you know, most phosphate concentrate comes from the Middle East and North Africa. So at the end of the day, these aren't necessarily jurisdictions that you would love to be reliant on. And, and yet, here we are reliant on them. So Ariane's project in, uh, in Quebec, Canada, of course, will address a lot of these uh, security supply issues. Um, project is very large. It's the largest greenfield phosphate deposit. Uh, the mine itself is fully permitted, shovel ready. So a, a very advanced project, not something that is the exploration stages. And, you know, it's, it's well located even within Quebec. So it is just north of the Saguenay region. So we were fortunate in that it was far enough from a population center that would ultimately then, if, if it weren't far away, would have proven to be maybe a little bit more difficult from uh, an environmental permitting standpoint, but close enough to a population center that a lot of the required infrastructure for our project uh, is, is in place. So that's a hydroelectric dam, uh, 30 kilometers away, it's oversized haul roads that, that are already in place. And, you know, as, as I've already alluded to, the, the mine itself is, is fully permitted, um, shovel ready, makes a very good quality phosphate, which, which I'll come back to in, in a little bit, but, um, yeah, that's, that's the backdrop. And I, I guess maybe just one other thing um phosphate you know most of your listeners I'm, I'm sure understand it as an agricultural commodity which it by and large is 85 percent of phosphate winds up in in fertilizers like like map and dap uh, but there is a growing use in in other applications um you know things ultimately industrial uses like like the lfp battery um, I want to touch on both ag and LFP here in a minute, but um, in February, you had announced uh, you were conducting a pre-feasibility study uh, for downstream applications. Um, you know, what sort of updates can you provide on that uh, topic? Yeah, so uh, very good. Yes. So uh, as, as I was kind of... Um, uh, had alluded to at the time, we, we'd commenced a, a pre-feasibility study on, on a downstream um, asset. So 
basically being able to put up a, a plant that would make a purified phosphoric acid. Um, so just so so the listeners understand, phosphate can basically be made into you know three buckets of products. So we we already touched on on the first one where most of it winds up with which is the dry bulk fertilizers like like MAP and DAP. Um, then there is a kind of a good tiered liquid phosphate that winds up going into things like animal feeds and, and specialty fertilizers. And then, you know, I guess at the, the top of, of the chain, you have purified phosphoric acid. And, and assuming you can attain um, that level of, of purity of, of your phosphoric acid, that's the type of stuff that either goes into uh, direct food additives, like in your Coca-Cola or things like that, or it goes into a battery, so battery grade acid, and that would be, for example, for the lithium iron phosphate battery. Now, what is interesting is if you take a look at, at projections, you know, there's a, a real supply uh, shortage coming for the purified phosphoric acid for, for LFPs. And, um, you know, that's definitely going to be a, a big opportunity. And one of the things that really matters is can you make that purified phosphoric acid and ultimately your ability to do so and your ratio to do so is going to depend highly on the type of phosphate concentrate that you are able to put in. So, um, look, in, in the case of Ariane, we would be mining um, from an igneous deposit. So the, these deposits are quite rare. Um, most of the world's phosphate comes from sedimentary deposits, so well, well over 90%. And the challenge with those are you have more deleterious elements, so you've got you know, radioactive elements like uranium and thorium. You've got heavy metals like cadmium and mercury and, and arsenic. And so you have a real challenge in trying to make a purified phosphoric acid. Now, depending the level of contaminant and what have you, you can make some purified phosphoric acid but you basically have this leftover and that leftover has to be made into fertilizer and the ratios like you know even assuming you have a good quality sedimentary deposit if you make one unit of purified phosphoric acid you're going to wind up with seven eight ten twelve units that then have to be made into fertilizer. And so the guys that right now are in a position, let's say, to ramp up their, their PPA production really aren't going to do that because they make their money selling fertilizer and they're going to make a whole lot more fertilizer. And that's not really something they want to do because they'll kill the market. So their ability to ramp up their PPA production is really going to be um, fully dependent on how much more fertilizer they can sell. Now, the igneous deposit, and in particular, the Ariane deposit, because we don't have those deleterious elements, we, in essence, don't have those leftovers. So we're not left with kind of the bottom of the barrel that we then have to turn into fertilizer. So we can make, um, you know, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of two thirds of our material can go into that purified phosphoric acid, about battery grade, and maybe a third goes into that good quality liquid that goes into the animal feeds and what have you. So understanding that opportunity 
um, really got us on the idea of let's look at what it's going to take for, for a downstream facility. And that was really the genesis of, of doing the pre-fees. So with that, uh, we're well along on, on the pre-fees. Um, our hope would be that we will be in a position to announce those, um, you know, results probably in the next, I don't know, three to four weeks or so. Um, and what the pre-fees is, is looking at is our ability to build the plant. Um, and that plant could, could be fed, of course, by, by our phosphate concentrate. And so we would be looking at a plant that would be able to produce about 350,000 tons a year of that purified phosphoric acid. And it would produce a little over 200,000 tons a year of that second tiered liquid. Again, that, that animal feed. So let, let's maybe talk about both of those markets. Um, maybe first that, that second tiered market. Um, you know, I, I use the term second tiered, but it's certainly not second class. Uh, maybe it's not as exciting as, as batteries and, and battery grade um, to investors, but really there's interesting opportunity there. Um, and that's really because some facilities right now that are producing that grade of, of acid, um, they're running out. And I think looking at the next two, three years, there's going to be a real shortage. And so this facility um, would be able to pick up a, a lot of, of that shortfall. So enough said on, on that. Now, purified phosphoric acid. Um, as mentioned, this study is um, addressing our ability to put up a facility that would produce 350,000 tons a year of purified phosphoric acid. Um, the PPA market, um, you know, has, has generally been in equilibrium. Uh, again, it's it's used right now predominantly for food and, and food additives. Uh, the global PPA market is somewhere around, you know, 4 million tons, but only a couple of million tons or half of that is a good enough quality that it can be made into that, that battery grade. So, you know, of course, with the popularity of, of the battery, and we can backtrack on this a, a bit, but with the popularity of, of the battery and, and the LFP, it's projected that now, we're going to need a couple of million more tons of the battery grade PPA. And there are expansions going on and what have you. But if you follow, for example, benchmark mineral intelligence, uh, they think that by 2030, even with some of the brownfields coming on and, you know, some other assets coming on stream, you're still looking at a, at a shortfall of about a million tons, which of course is quite substantial when, when you look at a, a base of a couple of million tons that it's on. So, you know, Ariane, our pre-feasibility is looking to address that, um, again, with, with production of 350,000 tons. And of course, if, if this facility is fed with Ariane rock or rock of similar quality, which is very difficult to find. But, um, you know, not only should it, uh, of course, be able to make that, but really should be able to make that in a fairly cost competitive way. So, again, we're looking for that to be out in the next few weeks. Um, and we will be excited to share that with the market as, as we receive that. Talk about the, the well, talk about the market a little bit. And as it relates to LFP batteries, 
the size of what it is and compared to, let's say, you know, maybe both auto and and sort of home batteries. And yep. as it relates also, maybe tie that into some of the recent tariff announcements that have been put in place here. Yeah. Right. So um, I'll, I'll try and remember all the questions you just asked me. Um, I'll remind I'm you. I'm not sure to, yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure you'll, you'll remind me. So, um, you know, let, let's start with, with the LFP battery, the lithium iron phosphate battery. You know, the, the irony of the LFP battery is even though China absolutely dominates it today, you know, they're, they're well over 95% of all LFPs. The irony is the battery was developed in North America. So it was developed in the 90s at the University of Texas. And then, you know, adding to that and advancing that work um, was here in Montreal, uh, University of Montreal and, and Hydro-Quebec. And they really did um, advance the battery, but it was slow on the commercial uptake. And so things like the NMC battery and what have you just seemed to do better. So the LFP actually made its way over to Asia and China used them in the early 2000s. It started with buses. And then, you know, the Olympics and everything went very well. And it became a national initiative for China to pursue the, the LFP. And they continued to advance it and technological advancements. And, you know, they built out the facilities and secure, secured the, the supply chain and got the, you know, economic benefits of first mover and size and and what have you. You know, all of a sudden, um, really, I, I guess the rest of the world started to understand that the benefits of, of the LFP battery, you know, first and foremost, no thermal runaway, you know, this thing's not going to burst into flames, uh, much longer life cycles, um, a lot more dynamic in terms of charging ranges and, and what you could do with it. And, and so, you know, we've really seen a move over the last couple of years to look to bring this here to the West. You know, a lot of the Western car companies have talked about now using the LFP and they've started to use the LFP. What is interesting is that even today in the West not being a player, what have you, 30% of all batteries are LFP. So, you know, the, the people listening to, to this um, interview should really understand that, you know, this isn't an out there technology and maybe and someday and possibly, and it's all high hopes and, and what have you. You know, no, this battery has been around for a long time commercial it's proliferated and and now the west is is coming along as well so again today it's over 30 percent of all batteries and by the end of this decade it is projected to be the most common of all batteries and so um you know, one thing that i get asked you know particularly the last couple of months is well you know with the ev stalling out you know what does that do for the prospects of, of the lfp battery and i i think people need to recognize a couple of things first the idea of stalling out it, it's not stalling out every you know new technology as it rolls out there's always a question mark at, What's the pace of growth? Is it going to grow 70% a year, 40% a year, 90% a year, or 10% a year? But I think the one thing that we can all be pretty certain of is its growth. You, you know, we know uh, the trajectory, what the rate of trajectory is. You know, I don't know. Uh, you know, no one knows, but it will be higher this year than last year, and it'll be higher next year than this year. And, you know, even when a Tesla 
you know, guides down, let's understand that they are not guiding down lower than was, you know, maybe the, the rate of growth. And so the EV is here, this battery is the battery and, you know, let's, let's get that understood. So we will need more. Um, but a another point is the LFP battery, because of some of the characteristics we had talked about, um, is actually ideal for energy storage systems. So if you put solar panels on your roof, it's great. You're capturing that, that energy, that free energy from the sun. But it's one thing to capture. It's another thing to store it because there's a pretty good chance that you need that electricity, not middle of the day when it's sunny, but you need it at the end of the day when it's dark and you've come home from work. And so um, the battery today is actually over 80% of all energy storage systems today, energy storage systems, not backup generators, but energy storage systems are LFP based. And this is a market that is going to grow a lot. Um, between now and kind of 2030, the LFP for energy storage is projected to grow at fivefold. And the energy storage component of the LFP is going to be somewhere between 30 and 40%. So again, I think it's something that's very important to understand as people wonder the growth around the EV and, and again, at what rate is it going to grow year over year? Um, there's also the energy storage component, which is growing, um, is the technology as more and more people look to lessen their requirements from the grid. And as the grid itself is hoping to, um, lessen its need, um, by way of households and, and that the energy storage systems, they're bulking up and, and that means the LFP. So, you know, that, that that's just kind of your, your overall backdrop. Circling back on, on, on two from, from a regulatory perspective, policy perspective, the tariffs, and then also the strategic, uh, I, I forget the terminology that, that was used, sort of the, the strategic minerals list that this was added to in Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. So, um, yeah, let, let's start with with uh, your, your question in regards to regulatory or, or what have you. You know, obviously your viewers understand that the world's a bit of a mess right now. And, and you really... Um, start to see a, a fracturing of trade blocks, commercial interests, um, and access to critical minerals and, and critical technologies. China, um, in regards to these critical minerals, have been at it a very long time. Um, it, it, you know, they, they've done a good job. They've secured the technology, they've secured the supply chains, and the West now is is having to play catch up. And, you know, they are looking to do it in, in various ways. Government grants um, certainly been been one way. So things like the the IRA, the Infla Inflation Reduction Act, but you know, the EU and, and here in Canada, there, there are policies in place really trying to get that, um, you know, really going. Um, and then, you know, to your point, there are tariffs. I mean, um, the Biden administration, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, had announced a new set of tariffs, um, you know, quite extensive. So, you know, that will... I think continue to drive a, an interest and in, in business towards the West setting up its its own supply chain for these gigafactories and, and critical minerals. 
Um, so I think it's important to, to your point, Quebec a couple of months ago did put phosphate appetite, which is the phosphate bearing mineral um, on its critical mineral list that joined the European Union in terms of the critical mineral list. And, you know, I, I think at some point this year, Canada will be updating its national list. Um, you know, one, one would think that phosphate could make it its way onto that list. And, and although not on the U.S. list currently, uh, certainly, uh, I think it was about two, three months ago, some senators had put forth a, a motion to get phosphate added to, to that. So, look, phosphate is important. Um, you know, it was important beforehand because without phosphate, we're going to starve to death. And that makes it pretty critical in, in my mind. But, you know, certainly now with, with the LFP battery, it's it's even more critical. You know, there's there's another thing that that I'd like to add on here. Um, so er, earlier, well, last week, I was at, at the SME in New York. I was on a panel and, you know, the, the question came up, what can we do to wean off of China when it comes to you know, the batteries, the materials, and, and what have you. And so, um, look, obviously, we're going to have to advance our own, um, you know, in industry, and, and that's every aspect of it, right? It's uh, getting the um, proliferation, the use of the battery, you know, the building the gigafactories to, to, to make those batteries and, and ultimately sourcing those cathode active materials to make the batteries and, and ultimately the mines that, that can provide those, those camps. Um, but it, it takes time. And, you know, one problem that, that, that I, I think that the West has is the idea of time frame. So, we want it and we want it now. You, you know, we are judged quarter by quarter, um, you know, trade by trade. Um, and an investment isn't really an investment anymore. It's a trade. Whereas in the East, their thinking is truly long term and it's something that we're going to need. And, and, you know, if it takes five years or 10 years, um, but ultimately it's an important piece in the future, then that's what it takes. You know, I, I like to say that nine women can't have a baby in a month. You know, it's one woman and it takes nine months. You can have nine women in the room, but it's not going to change anything. And so I think here in the West, as we're looking to build out our own network uh, for the critical minerals, we need to understand that this is going to take time. I already said the LFP has been around for a long time and China's been at it for a long time. So everyone looking at the IRA and, oh, you know, this is going nowhere. It's only been around for a couple of years. Well, what's gone on? Is it really, you know, can we ever even get away from China and, and, and that? Look, it's it's only been a couple of years. This is going to take some time, and I think, you know, for us to ultimately be successful, we we need to understand that and and stay with it. This is going to take some time. All right, Brian. Um, we've got maybe a couple of minutes left here. Let's circle back to the project. Um, obviously, you've talked about in the past, sort of you know, largest, world's you know, safest greenfield deposit. We talked about all the opportunities. We've talked about sort of the demand uh, for for phosphate, right? Whether it be LFP batteries, and and, and in, in particular, your uh, the type of deposit that you have, uh, sort of the igneous deposit. Uh, in terms of moving this forward, what does it sort of take to move this forward? And you know, I I don't want to pin you to any sort of time frames, but what should people be thinking about here? Yeah, look, I, I think that um, well. First of all, I, I think 
some people might be listening to this and and you know it's new and it's interesting and and you know we are not early stage just to be clear so some of your listeners might be hearing this story for the first time or come across it a few months ago but you know Ariane has been chasing this down now for over 12 years and has spent a hundred million dollars and again that hundred million dollars has got them a mind that's permitted and you know big and safe and pure and and all, all that good stuff um you know it's 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 definitely a a path and and it takes time um you know what should people be looking for you know for for a lot of time in the development of of Ariane of, of course when when things started it was all about fertilizer that's that's what phosphate was um in the last few years now with the battery um you know, it's it's not just fertilizer anymore. And again, you know, we're going to need the purified phosphoric acid. And because of Ariane's rock, an igneous deposit, it's really ideal for that. And so, you know, being a good Canadian, big fan of, of Wayne Gretzky and what made Wayne Gretzky such a great hockey player because he wasn't the biggest, he wasn't the fastest, he wasn't the strongest, he didn't have the hardest shot. Um, you know, what made him great was that he said he would always skate to where the puck was going to be, you know, not where it was. And so over the last two, three years, um, with the LFP and, and use of phosphate, for in industrial as as opposed to agricultural has really kind of come to where Ariane is because as we talked about the nature of your phosphate is going to determine things that you can do so of course with that there's been a, a wider range of interest in working with with Ariane so this this has moved beyond just the fertilizer companies and looking to cut a deal with with a fertilizer company. You know, at this point now, you've got the auto companies, the battery companies, you know, maybe even some of the food companies like that, that need that that second tier chemical companies. So it, it's really done a, a lot, I guess, for us um, as well. The fact that it's now a critical mineral. There's a bunch of private equity firms out there that have set up funds or looking to put some of their funds in into the critical minerals. So, you know, what do I see as as a roadmap, uh, as bumpy as it may be, and and detours maybe along the way, but really, um, you know, o over the next few weeks, again, our, our pre feasibility will come out. I, I think that that will be very important in that it will continue to set out our ability to address this market. Um, of course, we're already in conversations with uh, guys in, in the industries that, that I've just alluded to. This is a big project, right? It, this is going to cost a lot, a lot of money, but should be extremely profitable. And, and again, at, at 350,000 tons, uh, a year of PPA, we will be the single largest uh, PPA producer, battery grade PPA producer in the West, but by a lot. Um, and so, look, that's going to be a big opportunity. But again, this is going to be very expensive. It's going to require a partner or a couple of partners. Um, that's where those discussions are at. And certainly the one nice thing is being here in Canada and, you know, in particular Quebec, um, we want to build our, our own battery ecosystem. Um, the governments have shown a willingness to help get these projects going, help finance. So we're going to need a partner, which I'm, I'm hopeful we can bring home soon. Um, I think the government will, will be there. So 
you know, I, I think between now and the end of the year, there should be some more. I, I would hope that there will be some some good news on that front. With the partner, this thing gets built. Um, again, Ariane becomes the player in this specific market. The economics should be excellent, and and maybe our stock can start to reflect uh, the value that that's really there. You know, right now. I mean, we're we're trading sadly at at a fraction of uh, what our NPV is, and and heck, we're we're not even trading at that same hundred million dollars that we've spent to to get this asset to where it is. Right. All right. Well, as always, we we tend to run over our, our allotted time here, Brian. But I'm I'm always appreciative of the time uh, that you give to us here. Uh, I want to remind everyone again: if you'd like to schedule a meeting with Brian, uh, shoot me an email: bloom at lithampartners.com. Visit the website lithampartners.com forward slash spring 2024. Uh, click on that uh, registration button. We'll uh, look to get you taken care of. So, got a couple of additional uh, chats coming up here throughout the day. Uh, Brian, once again, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate the time.